The entire world is facing a debt-driven disaster the scale of which has never been seen before in human history. The situation is now so severe that we're left with only two options, default on our debt or inflate it away. You can already hear people blaming the free markets and even money itself for our problems, and to me this is just tragic, because we don't have free markets anymore, and we certainly don't use real money. This is the real reason for our problems. Our money itself has been corrupted. It's not just an issue of economics. This affects your freedom. When this crisis hits, people will be screaming for the government to do something when it was the government that caused the problems in the first place. Many societies have faced this dilemma in the past and we can learn what the outcomes might be simply by studying what they did and comparing it to what we're doing today. So while Germany, and this is one of the best museums I have ever seen, uh, right at the very beginning of the museum, you walk in and it starts with barter. You know, originally the first form of currency was livestock. The problem with livestock though, like for instance this cow, if I traded this cow to you for something, and somebody else wants to trade you something else that's of much lower value, you can't make change. <laughs> a system that relies on barter is very inefficient because you not only suffer from the problems of divisibility, you also rely on the hope that you will find someone who has a good or service that you need, who wants something that you have at the same place and at the same time. In economics, this is called the coincidence of wants. Now add the fact that most goods have a shelf life before they perish, and you can see why barter systems held mankind back for so long. So what was it that solved the coincidence of wants and propelled us out of the Stone Age and into space? It was the invention of money. Money is not evil. It is a magnificent tool that allows us to trade our specialized skills and to store our economic energy. Without it, we'd be struggling to feed ourselves each day and our average lifespan would still be 30. In episode one, we learned that real money has to fulfill certain properties in order to function. But 2,600 years after its emergence, people still confuse money with currency, even the so-called experts. So they've got here uh, some of the things about what money is. The first example here is money is whatever goes. So in earlier cultures, commodities such as cattle, stones, or metals were used as money. Buyers took the value of the goods on trust when making their purchase. Today, too, money is a question of confidence. So uh, the currency, today isn't money, today we're using currency, but the only reason it has any purchasing power whatsoever is because yesterday your experience was that it, it purchased something. So you have faith that it's going to purchase something tomorrow. Otherwise, it has no value. Whatever form it takes, reliable money has two characteristics. It is genuine and it is stable. People can rely on its value. Well, you know, what fiat currency around the planet has maintained its value? They all fall in value. So right away, you can see the difference. They're, they're talking about currency here. And when they say it's genuine, I mean, what is genuine? A counterfeiter, somebody that's running their own printing press in their basement, is making genuine notes as far as he's concerned. I mean, they're, they're genuine counterfeits. <laughs> These things that just come off of a printing press, well, yeah, it's a genuine lie from a central bank or a government that you've got something that's going to store value for you because it doesn't over long periods of time. It loses value. Gold, banknotes, and electronic money, meaning electronic currency, may be stored, divided up, or transported. As its material value has declined over time, its genuineness has had to be beyond question. Well, this one says that it's got to maintain its value, and right here they're contradicting uh, the, the next one. The one thing here, gold, is the only thing that they're talking about that has not lost its value. In the past, rare goods were used as money. Today, central banks must ensure that the supply of money is restricted. Well, what are they doing all over the planet today? They're lifting all the restrictions on how much currency they're creating. They're flooding the planet with currency. The next display shows the usual museum pieces that are described as commodity money. Cowrie shells, representative axes, coca beans, and the like. While these work better than barter, none of them were actually money 
because they all had a weakness, one or more properties of money that they couldn't fulfill. Therefore, they are commodity currencies, not money. Some of these were widely used right up until the beginning of the 20th century, and there's some stuff here that I haven't seen before. Here's something very interesting. This brick of tea, its value is in the intrinsic. It's in the commodity that you're using. It's, it's the tea. But this one has a certain fungibility to it. Each unit would have the same value, and you can make change. You can snap these things apart into units of six. It's portable. It's not that heavy. This fulfills quite a few of the functions of money. I would not imagine that it's that durable. It probably doesn't wear that well. And now we come to the emergence of real money. Here we have little pieces of metal, just little pieces that have been broken off of bars or something that was cast, uh, other little blobs of metal that were traded as a currency. You know, they had purchasing power, they had an intrinsic value, but they still weren't fungible, which means interchangeable. Every one of them had a, a different value. You can see that some of them have a higher silver content, some of them have a higher gold content. These are called electrum. It's a mixture of gold and silver, naturally occurring. What you notice is that this is from the 7th century BC, and then between the 7th and the 6th century, we're talking about somewhere between 680 and 630 BC, the emergence of true money. Here we've got four coins. The large one is a one-third stater coin, and the other three are one-sixth stater coins. Each unit is interchangeable. You can, it's now a unit of account. You can take so many of these in trade for so many of loaves of bread, and you don't have to get, break out your little scale and weigh them any longer. With the little chunks of metal, you had to weigh every transaction that was going on. You had to weigh whatever your payment was and then take a guess as to what the purity was. Here you have some standards that were set by mints and guaranteed by those mints. These are a unit of account. They're fungible. Every one of them is interchangeable. They're portable, they're durable uh, in your pocket over long periods of time. Uh, they're divisible, you can make change. You can see there's a one-third stater and one-sixth staters. Uh, and they're a store of value over long periods of time. These still have purchasing power today, uh, 2,600 years after they were made. Another thing that I find really interesting is between maybe 680 BC and, and 300 BC, cultures all around the world, they all gravitated toward gold and silver coinage as money. The entire world sort of decided all together that gold and silver were money. Why? Because the free markets keep on selecting gold and silver as money because of the properties that it has.